This is the Stop Time Podcast. I'm your host, Lisa Hopkins, and I'm here to engage you in thought-provoking motivational conversations around practicing the art of living in the moment. I'm a certified life coach, and I'm excited to dig deep and offer insights into embracing who we are and where we are at. I'm so excited to introduce you to my next guest. Kenneth Fallon is a caricature artist whose pen and ink celebrity portraits have been published internationally by such diverse and distinguished publications as the Wall Street Journal, InStyle Magazine, The New Yorker, The Hollywood Reporter, The Los Angeles Times, The Chicago Tribune, Washington Post, and Barron's Magazine. He received an Emmy Award nomination for his animated commercial for CNBC's Squawk Box show and has several posters in the permanent poster collection of London's Victoria and Albert Museum. His drawings are also on the walls of the Players Club. A permanent collection of original drawings and prints is on display at New World Stages in New York City, so check it out if you're in the neighborhood. Private collectors of Ken's work include Angela Lansbury, Kelly O'Hara, Stephen Schwartz, Warren Buffett, Barbara Streisand, Sarah Jessica Parker, Bernadette Peters, Sarah Paulson, Bradley Cooper, Sir Patrick Stewart, Harold Prince, and Sir Cameron McIntosh. Welcome to the Stop Time Podcast, Ken. So great to have you. Thank you. You have such a unique gift. Your ability to capture the essence of a person is remarkable and kind of what brought us together here today. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Do you see it as a gift, first of all? Well, I guess it really is. It's something that I started doing when I was very young because of Mad Magazine and cartoons. I started drawing cartoons. And then when I discovered caricature, I tried doing it and it was crude at first, but I people would recognize my drawings. So I think it is a gift. I think it's like uh, people that are good with music or math or languages. I think there's just something in there, uh, the wiring somehow it comes out and uh, I'm, I'm, amazed by it. I'm sometimes very frustrated when it doesn't come out right, but it's also when it comes out right, I sometimes don't know how I did it. It's it's always a, a mystery, which keeps it exciting. I think. Yeah. No, I mean, I think um, as, as an artist, I'm so curious to know, I, P.S., you know, I'm a visual mm. artist, but with, I use my body, <laughs> uh-huh. um, you know, I'm a dancer, right? So right. I, I cannot pen and paper no way. Pen and paper, if I'm writing a story, absolutely. So I, I just, you know, I am in reverence of, of, of you and those like you who can express yourself in that way. It's remarkable to me. And I'm so curious, like, you know, as a dancer, I feel it from the inside out, um, mm-hmm. mostly. Um, so it's sort of the feeling comes, you know, and, and, and then I express myself. I feel like there's an aspect of what you do where you're interpreting something. I mean, we interpret the music probably in the same way that you interpret your subjects. Talk to me a little bit about the inner outer aspect of your work. Well, it starts with the image. Um, I look at a person, I usually work from photographs and I look at a photograph and hopefully right away, I see something, some personality or something. It can be in the eyes can be in the mouth, can be in all of those things. And I I really just start, I guess the way a composer does, it's with a blank piece of paper and I just start drawing. And somehow that all comes together. Not always, but usually if the gods are smiling on me right away, I get something. And and I don't really think of it as exaggerating. I just sort of, like what you were talking about, dancing, it's just sort of expressing a line or something and and trying to get that personality in it. Experimentation. Mm. Racer is my friend. (laughs) You, you, you do things and and it's always done in pencil first before I ink it in. Oh, that's interesting. So do you like when you're uh, making changes in the process, do you just, do do you erase or do you actually scrap the paper and start again? Oh no, I'm, (laughs) I have such a thing about throwing paper away. I I did a drawing once where I had done a pencil drawing and I did a completely new drawing on the, on the surface of that board and someone bought the original and then they 
called me up and they were very excited. They said, we're seeing another drawing coming through. And I was very embarrassed because I have this phobia about wasting paper. But no, I, I erase whatever section or eye or nose, nostril, whatever is uh, not working for me. So it's, mm. it's strictly erasing. Yeah. So what, what does it feel like? Like, I'm sure, I mean, my understanding of you and, and tell me, you know, in the way you work is you're a freelancer, yes, um, right? Um, like most of us. <laughs> and yeah. that, that um, you get asked or you get a gig to do a drawing. Right. And it must be very different for, for you because <laughs> it's like, I, I guess what I'm getting at is, you know, someone says, you know, draw me, for instance. Um, mm -hmm. What if you're not, what if you're not feeling it? Like, what, you know what I mean? How do, how do you get to that place? Sometimes if it's not working, I will just stop and go away for an hour, sometimes longer and come back and try again. Usually the second time it, it works, but I think sometimes for whatever reason, it's, it, I'm just not getting it. And uh I think about this a lot. A lot of times when I'm drawing, my mind is like blank. It's just the drawing. I'm drawing and it's not automatic, but I'm not really concentrating that much. And sometimes when I try to concentrate, it just doesn't come out right. So when I concentrate is when I'm inking and trying to make the drawing look as sharp and so forth as possible. But I don't, I don't know. It's, it's really, I, like I said before, it's, it's sort of a mystery to me how it, how it uh, transpires. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. That makes sense. I mean, I, it sounds like you're describing flow. Um, right. Yeah. If I'm hearing you correctly, when you ink it, that's when it becomes a little bit more technical. You've already really mm -hmm. created the art, but now you're um, delivering it in a way that is, is your style. And that, that sort of is, is expected and that you know how to do, but it's, it's not really, um, it's a different part of the brain almost, isn't it? Really. And, you know, every time I started drawing, I'm nervous because I'm always thinking that it's not going to come back again. And I've done thousands of drawings and I've had success. And yeah, absolutely. Imposter syndrome is huge. Mm. Oh, there you go. <laughs> it's huge among artists. Um, oh, yeah. yes. Isn't yeah. That yeah. Interesting. Yeah, it is. Gotta find us out. <laughs> well, that's it. Right. And it's sort of like when you're in it, I think part of it is because when when you're in it, you're just doing it innately. It's instinctive. Mm -hmm. It's intuition. You're totally tapped in so that, you know, cognitively when you're, when you've done it and when something is, is done and, and, you know, it's, it's paid or up on the stage or in a magazine or whatever, right. then you kind of look at it, you know, from a different perspective and go, huh, did I do that? Right. And then someone asks you to do it again. You're like, Oh, I know. That's why I'm, I'm not a, a fast artist. I could never do boardwalk caricatures. A few years ago, um, Microsoft was introducing a new computer that you drew on, and they hired all of Times Square. They took all of the electronic billboards in Times Square, and they put all of these uh, stations around Times Square with, a, with the computer on it, and they hired a dozen different artists that worked in different styles and had them draw on these a, a computer screen. And when they, when you were doing that, and I was one of these artists, they would flash it up on all of the signs at once. It was like this amazing situation. Unfortunately, I mean, I did it, but that's not how I work. So they would have, you know, you just have a stranger walk by and you'd say, excuse me, would you like to have your caricature drawn? Mm. Would come over and face me and I'm doing it, but I want to array, you know, I, I went against everything that I that I do, but I managed to do it and they paid me well. So it worked out, but that's not how I, I work. Oh, how interesting. And there wow. I was in front of all those people. I mean, there, my work was on all these giant signs. So I couldn't hide. Yeah. And wow. So first of all, <laughs> how courageous of you? <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm one of those people. It was exciting, you know, to, to yeah. think that. And, uh, yeah, I don't know if it was courage or just um, mixed with insanity, and uh, <laughs> I really don't know. What do you? What? Do, what were your takeaway? What did you learn about yourself from doing it? Do you think? What did I learn about myself from doing that? Well, that I would 
dive right in. It, it, it pleased me because I, even though I knew that I didn't work that way, I was going to try it anyway. I've, I've had some pretty big advertising jobs in my life, and I'm always fascinated that I'm not nervous when I go to do one of those drawings. And this is a lot of um, a, a lot of exposure, and I'm working with advertising agents and the client and so forth. I just don't worry about it. I do the drawing, and sometimes they make little changes and so forth, but I've been very lucky. I've, I've most of my uh, advertising work has sailed right through, hmm. and I'm happy about that because I wouldn't want to uh, be a nervous wreck every time that I got a big job. But I, big jobs, little jobs, it's all it's always the same. Yeah, my mind when I go to do the actual drawing. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, yeah. It, it would be difficult to not do what you do, no matter what the gig, right? I mean. Exactly. I did a um, a newspaper ad for a squawk box, and it was a drawing of, I think there were eight business leaders at that time. And it was like Martha Stewart and uh, Donald Trump was one of them. It was a whole bunch of big time people. And when they called me, when my agent called me and told me I had the job and told me how much I was being paid, I was really excited. And then he said, well, all of the people you're drawing get to approve their drawing. And I thought, oh boy, mm. <laughs> such a task. And it actually turned out Warren Buffett wanted to be smiling and someone else, I think they wanted their tie changed. It was so small what I had to do. Mm. And uh, it, it went right through and then they animated it. And I like, I got the Emmy nomination, which was very bizarre. Yeah. Congratulations. Were any of those done in person or were those also done off of photographs that they chose or how did you select the images? I actually had to look up the images. Uh, most of the clients do that now because they know with access to Google images and so forth that you can find anything that they could send you just about. So it's always photographs. I've done some private sittings and sometimes when I do a private commission, I throw that in. Mm. I will come to your place and you can sit for me. But I really, I do a quick sketch. I probably don't even use that sketch when I get back home. I take, I use photographs because it's a frozen image and you can study it. And usually when you're doing a live uh, pose, it's very hard for people to keep a pose very long. I don't, I really don't know how the portrait artists do it. Mm. So they do it, but they use photographs too. Like working for the Wall Street Journal, a lot of people think, oh, what a glamorous job. I said, yes, but I don't get to travel anywhere. I work from photographs and I don't get to meet the people. Sometimes I've met people later on, but. Uh, mm. Yeah. So your connection to Hirschfeld, obvious, right? I mean, mm -hmm. tell me a little bit about that and how that sort of affects, helps, hinders. Well, we go way back because uh, I think right after Mad Magazine, I saw an a, a, a article, an, an article in Life Magazine, and it was, it was about Hirschfeld, and they showed several of his drawings. I didn't know who he was. I didn't know who any of the people were that he drew. I was probably about 12 or whatever, but I loved the style. I started trying to draw that way, and I would draw neighbors and friends and people that went to church and so forth. And or some of them were chasing me with a hammer <laughs> after I did their caricature, but it fascinated me. And then a few years later, I grew up in Florida, by the way, and we didn't have a lot of theater there, but the librarian in my high school would save the uh, arts and leisure section for me every week and give it to me. And they were, of course, Hirschfeld's drawings were on there. And that really excited me being able to see those. And I didn't really study caricature. I went to art school, but they don't really, you know, teach you style and so forth. And I was actually trying to do other things because when I, when you're an illustrator, you're trying to develop different styles and so forth. But in 1983, there was a show that opened off Broadway called Forbidden Broadway. And if you're familiar with the show, they spoof Broadway musicals and songs and so forth. So they decided after they had been running for about nine months, they wanted an ad that spoofed Hirschfeld. And I got the job. <laughs> 
the amazing thing is that really put me on the map. I suddenly was getting all of this work uh, that they wanted in that style, mm. which was a blessing. But also I started taking that style and, and making it my own, you know, changing certain things. And I was just inspired by his work, but I wanted it to be unique to myself. And that's what I've tried to do since I actually started getting, you know, big jobs and so forth. One time I got a big job from an American Express and I was hired. I was, I replaced him because I, I don't know, they, they had a disagreement about something, he and his agents. So that was a blessing for me. And I actually got this job, but um, I, I'm proud. I mean, I'm, I'm get very uh, pleased when people compare me to Herschel because I think he's so brilliant. Mm. Uh, mm. I met did him a few times. Yes. Yeah, I was going to ask, did you ever get the opportunity to to talk shop with him? Or I met him about three or four times. And one time uh, was in Boston at Harvard. They were honoring Herschel. There was a big exhibit there. And I was invited. And the night that I went, I took friends of mine with me and I dropped them off at Harvard Yard and then I'm trying to find a parking space. I don't know if you're familiar with that area, but it's impossible. I was cursing and screaming and I'm driving around the car and thinking, this is just, you know, I'm supposed to be in there. <laughs> I'm trying to park the car. So I finally found a parking space and I get out and I go to the entrance to Harvard Yard and a cab pulls up and who gets out Hirschfeld and his wife. I ran over and greeted them. And I think they thought I was part of the, the Harvard uh, committee or something. And I walked them over to the uh, place where the exhibit was being held and we were talking and so forth. And it was so funny because I walked in with Hirschfeld on one side of me and Dolly Haas on the other. And the audience, they, all these people are applauding. I think they thought that I was, you know, somebody to do, that dealt with Harvard. But that was one of those timing things that. Uh, yeah. But I've since, after he passed away, uh, a friend of mine knew the Hirschfelds, and he introduced me to Louise Hirschfeld, his widow. Mm. And she was so nice to me and very encouraging and told me that she really liked my work. And she invited me one day over to the uh, townhouse where she was still living, where they, Hirschfeld has a studio. And it's funny, when he passed away, I thought, I'll never get to see his studio. And that was mm. what I always wanted to do. So this afternoon that I went, she's showing me the house. And she we go up to the top floor, and she's standing in front of the door. She says, now, I have changed nothing. You're going to walk in, and it, it's exactly left the way it was. Mm. And she the door, and it was like a religious experience. I mean, I... Uh, I was floating on air. And then she said to me, Ken, would you like to sit in the barber chair behind his desk? And of course I did. And I had pictures of it and I was just floating. It was really an amazing experience. Something mm. never thought that I would do. So it, at the Hirschfeld Association has been very good for me. And I'm friends with the people that run the Hirschfeld Foundation. And um, it, it's just been very good much more positive than negative. That's amazing. Well, and you strike me as a very positive person too. So chances are you, you're interpreting it in a very positive light. <laughs> That's very kind. Thank you, Lisa. No, I, it's uh, your energy is beautiful. Um, sounds like from your point of view, it's really helped and, and certainly been a, a positive. And I'm just, I'm just curious, just as a, as an artist, um, do you ever feel like, damn it, I'm just going to do something else that, that isn't even remotely in the style of, of Hirschfeld, like, do you do you live in that? Yes, <laughs> yes. As a matter of fact, um, whenever I first started sending uh, portfolios and so forth to the New Yorker, they kept saying, "Well, we really like your work, but it's like Hirschfeld, and we've you know we published him and so forth." And then I did a drawing of Patty Lapone. I don't know if I told you that I do theater drawings for, I did them for Playbill and now I'm with broadwayworld.com. And I did this drawing and it's completely different. Mm -hmm. And I sent that to them and that landed me a job. They went for that style. So I do occasionally do that. It's, it's, um, 
it's really out of my comfort zone, but it's also challenging and very exciting if I get it right. People like to put people in silos because we're hardwired to do that. Oh, yes. our, our brain has so much information that we like to go, okay, he's the guy that, that draws like this and she's mm-hmm. the girl. But tell me something that I don't know about you. Well, I just started writing plays about five years ago. I love it. It's a, another creative outlet, but it's completely different from the, uh, the illustration work. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, so much, um, so much has shifted in the world over the past, well, I guess 16 months or so. And Oh, yes. <laughs> I'm curious to know what, what discoveries you've made about yourself that maybe you, you might not have otherwise discovered. I was, I was actually pleased with the way I dealt with all of this. Um, I live uh, right across from Riverside Park, and I have a, a wonderful dog that, that I walk several times a day, and we go into the park. And when, we were, when you were in the park, you didn't really feel like there was this um, pandemic going on. It was very, very nice and beautiful and relaxing, and I would sit by the river. And that helped me a great deal, but I, I felt like I was really trying to adjust and not just uh, get depressed about it. I mean, it was very difficult, but uh, that's really the thing that I did. And my dog helped me a great deal, too, having that. I discovered that I, I guess I'm a survivor in a way. I was also lucky, Lisa, in that my work did not stop during that period. I was actually, well, the Wall Street Journal was going strong. So I, I still had that. And I got a lot of private commissions. And I even got a really big job with a hotel chain. So financially, it was not a bad period, which I, I can imagine was really a, a big help. Most people did not have that. So, Yeah. No, absolutely. And you being um, very much ensconced in the Broadway community with, with the work that's that you true. do. Well, that's true. I, I actually went to my first Broadway show last night. You did? I went to see Passover. Did it feel different, the energy of the room? I mean, was it a little bit trepidatious or? No, that's the surprising thing. The audience was just, there was so much energy. And at the end, the curtain calls were just, you know, it was like yeah. a football game. I think yeah. they were very happy to be there and they felt relieved and they enjoyed the performance. So, yeah. What do you know will be true about you no matter what happens? So no, no matter what you did, if you never drew again, if, if, what do you know, you know, no one can take from you? Well, I still have a sense of, uh, I, you'll never know what's going to happen next. I started saying that back when I was in high school, that every day I'd get out of bed and just think, well, you never know what's going to happen next, which is so true. And it could be good and could be terrible, but it, it sort of keeps you uh, alert and my life has really been, I guess, like a lot of people, but it has been an adventure and a lot of things fell out of the sky. And mm-hmm. I never imagined some of the things that happened to me. I mean, I've been all over the world, places that I would have never even thought about going to that turned out to be great and just lecturing on this thing that I love. <laughs> so, so you wake up in the morning ready to receive, right? It always, <laughs> always. How, how do you want to be remembered? I think as a nice person, I think that's the most important thing. I guess we all want to be liked and loved, but uh, I try to be friendly and interested in people. And that's really the most important thing to me, just to have other people think that I was a a good person and a nice person. Mm. I'm not really sure what the... um, Things are changing so fast, like with print and so forth. I don't know how long the work will be around. It changed drastically during my career. And uh, so I don't really think too much about that. I'm always happy when people buy my work. I think that maybe their great grandchildren will get it eventually. But it's that's not really the most important thing. Mm -hmm. What is what is your definition of living in the moment? Just enjoying it and not really thinking about tomorrow or yesterday. I'm, I'm getting up there. I'm, I'm as old as my dog now. I'm a senior citizen. So it, <laughs> that changes you. That really changes you when you're, uh, I think, my generation, the baby boomers. I don't think we were ever really gave that much thought to getting older. And so when, we, when it started happening, it's, uh, it, it really changes your perspective. And 
you know, older people, when we're growing up, they tell you these things. And I don't know, it goes right out. <laughs> you don't really grasp it because I don't think it's, it's conceivable at that time. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of much younger friends, especially in the theater. And I tell them things like, you know, enjoy this and really grab hold of it and just savor it because you know, it's a short time and, and, and later on in life, you'll think, well, gee, why didn't I stop and just really enjoy that moment instead of the thinking about all the things that were going wrong? Or, yeah. Or what's next, right? Right. Absolutely. So. Yeah. No, it's, I mean, literally the, the human race, mm -hmm. we're all racing towards the same right. finish line. We all have the yeah. same finish line. <laughs> That's right. And I think this thing that we all just went through really let us know that everybody can be affected by the same thing all over the world. No, I agree. And I, I think there's a gift in that. I mean, as you know, destructive as it has been and, and disruptive as it has mm -hmm. been, the massive gift of this collective trauma is that it really leveled for a minute the playing field of it was yes. happening to all of us. That's correct. That we are all vulnerable to the mm -hmm. same things at the end of the day. Can you finish this phrase? Um, most people think, um, Kenneth Fallon is dot, 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 but the truth is, oh, gee, well, most people probably think that I have a really glamorous life. It is glamorous, but I don't think it's as glamorous as they think wouldn't change it. I mean, I know a lot of famous people I've been social with them and have loved every minute of it, but, um, I'm much plainer than that. <laughs> Love it. So how do you feel about playing? What makes you? I'm going to say a word and you just say first thing that comes to mind. Here we go. What makes you hungry? Challenge, I guess. If it's something uh, challenging, I'm hungry to try to do it. Love it. What makes you sad? I guess what makes me sad is when I know that some people are cruel. Mm other humans and to animals and so forth. So cruelty is really the thing that makes me sad. Yeah. What inspires you? Usually people, mm. uh, people that have done great things or people that are just great humans. I'm inspired by humans. Mm. And what frustrates you? Sometimes not being able to uh, accomplish something. And I'm, I'm also frustrated by politics sometimes mm -hmm. things you know like what's going on right now can mm. be frustrating yeah what makes you laugh well the biggest comedian that i have is my dog but i'm i'm a great audience i love to laugh my grandmother i think i take after her with this she had this wonderful laugh and mm. go to the theater or go to a movie or something the audience the performers love it when I, if they know me then i'm in the audience because it's such a wonderful relief i love laughing mm. what makes you angry uh again people that are cruel and don't care about their fellow man yeah and finally what makes you grateful at the moment my health and i'm very grateful for the life that i've had the thing, I, as I said earlier, a lot of things have fallen out of the sky that I never thought would happen. And I'm, I'm just very grateful. And it's, you ask me that. It's something that I think about a lot, that I'm a very fortunate person and that I'm doing work that I love to do. I love getting out of bed in the morning because I've had periods in my life where I did not have that. So I really appreciate that. That's what mm. I'm that's beautiful. What are the top three things that have happened so far today? Mm. <laughs> well, this has been very nice, <laughs> a very uh, pleasant experience talking to you. And um, let me see. This is going. This will seem trivial in a way, but um, I have a UPS man who is very, very nice, and I've had. I ship, I sell a lot of my prints and I have to ship them out. And today my UPS man could not make it. So he told the man that was taking his place specifically to 
take care of me, that I had something that was going out. And this, you know, I, I keep thinking I live in New York and people can be indifferent or whatever, but this person not only helped me, but he was very cheerful. And that was just such a nice thing that happened, a very uh, tiny but important thing. Mm. Absolutely. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for taking time to be with me today. Really. Thank you, Lisa. It was a pleasure. And I'm very happy to meet you. Such a pleasure. I've been speaking today with Kenneth Fallon. I'm Lisa Hopkins. Thanks for listening, everyone. Stay safe and healthy. And remember to live in the moment. In music, stop time is that beautiful moment where the band is suspended in rhythmic unison, supporting the soloist to express their individuality. In the moment, I encourage you to take that time and create your own rhythm. Until next time, I'm Lisa Hopkins. Thanks for listening.